The Lord's presence is so great to be present with you today. I'm thankful to be back at Champion Force. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, it's a special blessing for me uh, to be here on such a special day for this church family. I don't know if you stopped to think about it, but two years ago on this Sunday, uh, the Lord through you did something very special. As the Lord, through the affirmation of this church family, called Pastor Jarrett and Debbie to serve here at Champion Forest. I'm telling you, I celebrate that with you. I'm thankful for Jarrett, for Debbie, for their beautiful, uh, four beautiful daughters. I I'm thankful for uh, the way the Lord's hand has been upon his life and his ministry uh, since the Lord called him, but I'm especially thankful uh, that the Lord has called him here to such a wonderful church and to see what God is doing. Uh, I've been watching and uh, celebrating with you as hundreds joining the church each year and just seeing the church move forward in such a strong way. And I know Pastor Jerry be the first one to say, yet not I, but through Christ in me, as we sang today. But uh, indeed, I join you in just saying thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, calling this faithful pastor to serve this faithful church family. What the Lord is doing in extending your reach across this city and state and, and across North America, but from my perspective, being able to see what God is doing in extending your reach and your ministry to the nations is such an incredible thing to behold. This church began right about 1970, I'm told. That's the year I was born, so I should be able to remember the birthday of uh, Champion Force. And yet to see that from the very beginning of the church, there was a partnership that you had with the International Mission Board that on day one began to extend your ministry. And now to see with those 3,500 plus missionaries, there are 2,850 kids who are living all over the world and how God is using them. Just this past year, more than half a million people around the world heard the gospel through your IMB missionaries and, and their Baptist partners, those churches that they've started on the ground and the people they've trained and equipped and discipled to share the gospel. Of those more than half a million who heard the gospel, 176,000 professed faith in Christ. And we celebrate the new life being found because of what you're doing among the nations. Those 176,000, so many of them followed through with believers' baptism. I think just more than 107,000 of those new believers were baptized. And as Pastor Jared referenced, uh, many of our missionaries work in like closed countries, places that, that uh, you can't openly acknowledge even being a Christian, let alone being a missionary. And to know that tens of thousands of people in places like that were willing to risk their lives to be obedient to Jesus' example and command to be baptized. What an incredible thing. I know your church is big about multiplication and planting other churches. There were more than 22,000 new churches planted overseas as an extension of your work through the IMB just this past year. So thank you, church. I, I want to share with you this morning why what we're doing together in these ways is so important. But before I do that, let me just emphasize to you, if God has placed the nations on your heart, and as you hear talk about those missionaries who have gone out from Champion Forest and who are serving through the IMB, if God is directing you in that way, I want you to know that IMB, we would love to talk with you. Uh, we're sending missionaries today. We're sending uh, students for a semester or a summer or a gap year. Uh, we're sending young people uh, under the age of 30, no kids yet. You could be married or single for a two-year fully funded uh, mission experience, serving on our IMB teams around the world. We're sending more career missionaries. Hey, we're sending a lot of retirees these days. And it really doesn't matter what uh, your uh, life work has been. We can use it somewhere. You've been an accountant, a school teacher, a doctor, a nurse, uh, a, a farmer, a veterinarian, a police officer. We can use you somewhere if you would choose to give a few of your retirement years to share the gospel on a missionary team with the IMB. We would love to talk with you. 
as we think about the importance of what we're doing, I want to point us this morning to a passage of scripture in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, just give you a little context before uh, I uh, read this word aloud. The Apostle Paul addresses many very important subjects uh, in the book of Romans, gives such clarity to the gospel. One of the issues that Paul is addressing is a very personal issue for him. As Paul, a Jew, begins to take up the question of what is the place of the Jews now, God's covenant people in the Old Testament, now that the Savior has come, and yet knowing that so many of Paul's people, the Jews, as Paul once did, did not affirm Jesus as the Savior, did not believe that he was the Son of God, the Messiah. And so what of God's promises to Israel as we find them sprinkled throughout Scripture, are those promises still in effect, given that so many of the Jews had rejected Jesus? What Paul will make clear throughout the book of Romans and in other places is that indeed every promise God has ever made will be kept because God's word is always kept and is always true. But even as Paul affirms that God's promises to Israel will be kept, he also makes it clear that that does not excuse any individual, whether a Jew or not, from their own personal responsibility for their sin and for what they do with Jesus, the Savior. And Paul's addressing that here in Romans 3. I want to pick up with verse 9, and you follow along with me. We're going to read down through verse 18 as Paul, again, is talking about this, this reality of the Jews versus those who aren't Jews, the Gentiles, and their own responsibility for their sin. What then, he asked, are we Jews any better off? I mean, being a part of the covenant people of God, does that give us an advantage individually? He says, no, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Not one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, snakes, serpents is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And if those words were not condemning enough, here... Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Oh, what a terrible place to be. I have a question for you this morning as we think about Paul's words and God's word to us and what it means for each of us and for our world today. What, in your opinion, is the greatest problem facing our world today. What is the greatest problem in all the world? Uh, we begin a new year excited about uh, the opportunities that are in front of us here in 2023, but we're carrying a lot of last year's problems with us, are we not? The war in Ukraine has been a huge problem, not just for Eastern Europe, but really with threats of nuclear strikes. It, it, it's a worldwide problem. There have been millions and millions, of, almost a third of Ukraine's population has been displaced. The suffering, tremendous. But is that the worst problem in our world? If not, what is? Did you know that there's a special year we set aside as Southern Baptists, a special day, excuse me, every year we set aside as Southern Baptists, uh, to, to remember those who are hungry in the world, those who are food insecure, whether here in our country or overseas. It's the day we set aside to pray for them, to be generous, uh, to help uh, feed those who are starving. There are two billion people in our world who will struggle to find one meal to eat today. 345 million on the verge of starvation. Now, those are overwhelming numbers, aren't they? You think about the magnitude. How do you fix that problem? Two billion people struggling to find a meal. 345 million. That, by the way, that's 
the number of people on the verge of starvation has increased significantly just over the last year because of the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is one of those breadbasket countries, but not just for Eastern Europe, particularly for Sub-Saharan Africa. And so the issues there have become issues elsewhere. Is world hunger, is that the greatest problem facing our world today? You may not be aware of this, but there are more slaves in our world today than at any time in human history. There are more than 50 million people who are forced laborers, modern day slaves in our world. What an overwhelming problem. What, which of these is the greatest problem in the world? Or is it something else? I submit to you that the greatest problem in our world today can be communicated in a single word. And that word is lostness. Lostness, spiritual lostness. Now, in light of all the problems in the world, why would I say that being lost spiritually is the world's greatest problem? Well, because this is the only eternal problem. Did you know every other problem in your life pretty much ends the moment you die? <laughs> Uh, the, the moment you die, you won't care if your team made it in the college football playoffs or who's going to win. Uh, the moment you die, even your passion uh, for those uh, Houston baseball players uh, will be greatly diminished. You won't care if the Astros ever win another game. The moment you die, your lower back pain ends. <laughs> uh, the moment you die, the depression that has haunted you seasonally throughout your life you'll be free from it. Every problem you have in life has an easy solution. The moment you die, it's over but one. And the magnitude of that problem, if you are lost, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, if you've not been saved, the magnitude of that problem really only sets in the moment you die. Because at that moment, you will be separated from God forever in hell. The Bible says God is love. What would it be like to face eternity void of love? No love, no source of love in your life. Well, that's the hatred of hell. The scriptures say that the Spirit of God is our comfort. Or what would it be like to face eternity with no comfort in your life and no source of comfort? That's the agony, the suffering of hell. The Bible says that Christ is our joy. What would it be to spend eternity with no joy in your life? That is the sorrow and the grieving of hell. The scriptures say Jesus is your life. What would it be like to face eternity without Jesus? That's the eternal dying of hell. Spiritual lostness is the world's greatest problem because it is an eternal problem. But it's also the world's greatest problem because it's a universal problem. Other problems in life may or may not affect you. You may have experienced hunger. You may have never experienced hunger. You may have been uh, trafficked. You may have never had that horrible experience of human trafficking. Uh, you, you, you may have been in a war. You may have lost loved ones. You may have struggled with depression. But what is true of all of us as human beings, and this is the point that Paul makes so strongly here, whether Jew or Gentile, it, it doesn't matter who you are, this is everyone's problem. It's a universal problem. Paul, in addressing uh, the Jews and the situation with the Jews, many of them having denied Jesus as the Savior, makes the point that the Jews are no different than the Gentiles in this. It's everyone's problem. Paul says it clearly there in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all... Both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Now, Paul will go on here from making that statement in verse 9 to eight more times, just in the next couple of verses, drive home this fact that we are all under sin 
we all, if we are apart from Christ, are lost. Beginning in verse 10, we see uh, the second reference right away, as is written, uh, none is righteous, uh, not even one. Verse 11, no one understands, no one seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Uh, So Paul uh, leaves no confusion here about his opinion on this topic. Lostness is a universal problem because we have all sinned and fallen short. Now, if anyone were to be listening to Paul and and think, well, that may be true of others, but it's not true of me, Paul's going to provide an illustration to prove his point. As Paul says, in essence, if you're wondering if you're guilty, if you have sinned, if you have fallen short, if you're lost, then just consider for a moment your words. Uh, If he were with us today and Given modern technology, he might say, record yourself talking, play it back. You'll know then. In fact, uh, he states it as a problem of the tongue, a problem of the throat, a problem of uh, what we say. He says their, 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 their throat, verse 13, is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive, sort of like James does in James chapter 3. Uh, Paul here is making it clear that we need no more evidence other than our words to prove that we're sinful. Ran across an interesting article uh, in the Atlantic uh, earlier this year. It was, it was interesting to me because of the title of the article. And reading the title of the article, I thought I need to read the article. The article was entitled this, Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. So with that title, I thought, yeah, that's worth a read. Let's see what he has to say. And, and, and the author of that article is a fellow by the name of Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. He does something very interesting. He, he tries to diagnose our culture and its problems by pointing to social media. And, and he interestingly uses a, a, a biblical record, a, a, an episode that's recorded in the Bible uh, to make his point. He compares social media to the Tower of Babel. Do you remember, you, you remember that uh, account in the Old Testament where uh, all of the people came together wanting to do something to make a name for themselves? And so they decided, we'll work together and we will build a tower to the heavens. We will build a tower to God. And that building project that brought them together ended up driving them apart to the extent that even God confused their language and they could not communicate with one another. Well, well, the the author of the article used that to illustrate what social media has done to our society, at least in his opinion. He says it was supposed to bring us together. I mean, we call them Facebook friends, right? (laughs) Oh, but Facebook can be a very unfriendly place, can it not? He says, like the Tower of Babel, what promised to bring us together has driven us apart. But what he fails to do, and I was hoping he would do by the end of the article, he he, he just didn't get there. What he failed to point out is that the problem's not really social media. It's not Facebook or Twitter or whatever platform you're using. It's not uh, the keyboard or the screen, whether it's a big one or a small one. No, the problem is here. It's the heart, the depravity, the sinfulness of our hearts. Social media, the words that we type and post, or even the words that we would say to one another simply reveal the heart. Jesus said as much. He was speaking to the Pharisees, and you know, we had a very contentious relationship with them. And at one point, he pointed out that. Really, what you're saying just reveals your heart. The the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 34. Uh, Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees, says, You brood of vipers, you you bunch of snakes. (laughs) How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's interesting here in Romans 3, 
The Apostle Paul uses the same imagery that Jesus uses when he's talking about this problem of speech. Jesus called the Pharisees, you bunch of snakes, you brood of vipers. Well, Paul does essentially the same thing in Romans 3 verse 13 when he says the venom of asps or of snakes is under their lips. Anyone know a good snake story? <laughs> I have several, <laughs> but my best one is from my teenage years. Uh, it was between my seventh and eighth grade year that uh, I became aware that I could spend a week or two at a, at a camp on the other side of our state, uh, a, a wildlife conservation camp. I grew up way over on the eastern part of Tennessee, Kentucky, around the state line. This was over in the western part of the state, and, and uh, I had heard about it as a, a great place where you could learn about conservation and critters, and I was interested in both. But, but there were other things that caught my attention because I was told at conservation camp you get to dissect a beaver. And I thought that sounded really cool. You know, who knows the mind of a teenage boy? But, but uh, what, what I didn't know at the time is that the beaver would end up being frozen and have to be thawed out in the bathtub in my cabin. Uh, so th that was a bit of a downer, but we still had fun dissecting the beaver. Another exciting thing that was promised at conservation camp is you get to have rattlesnake for supper one night. And I never had rattlesnake for supper, so I thought, hey, I, I need to have that experience. But there were two things that made conservation camp just like legendary. One was the snake roundup. Uh, the other was the snake bite club. Now for the snake roundup, uh, what we did was sort of interesting. Don't think you'll get away with it today, but I I'd ridden a school bus from the mountains of southeastern Kentucky, East Tennessee for 10 hours to get to conservation camp over in the western part of the state. The night of the snake roundup, they put all the kids back on the school buses and they drove them out to a swamp and set us out to catch snakes all night. <laughs> now, can you imagine how that would go today? <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't as much as get the kids back on the bus before someone would file a lawsuit. <laughs> but I'm telling you, in 1983, you could literally load a school bus full of teenagers, dump them in a swamp, and let them catch snakes all night. And that's what we did. The next day was when, like conservation, it was the day we'd been waiting for. It was the crescendo of camp week. Because the next day was when they took the non-poisonous, non-venomous snakes that we had caught the night before and put some of them in a pillowcase. And one of the camp counselors carried that pillowcase throughout the camp and gave every camper, if they chose voluntarily, the opportunity to join the snake bite club. <laughs> Relatively simple process. Put your hand in the pillowcase, you're inducted. The problem is the cabin I was in, that cabin where they thought out the beaver in the bathtub, it was all the way down at the end of the row of cabins. And by the time the counselor got to our cabin with this pillowcase full of snakes, they were tired, apparently. <laughs> because I put my hand in the pillowcase and like nothing happened. So I, I'm saying to the counselor, like nothing's happening. I want to join the club. What do I do now? He said, well, pull one out. <laughs> and so I did. I reached down. I found one. I pulled it out. It, it hung there in my hand about as disinterested in me as my teenage daughter. <laughs> Not even glancing my way. And so I'm like, well, what do I do now? He said, well, slap him. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and he slapped me back. <laughs> A toothy slap right on the back of my hand. Now, let me offer a quick disclaimer. This was not church camp. <laughs> I'm a Baptist from the mountains. I'm not that kind of Baptist. <laughs> we had those churches in our community. I was not a member of one of those churches. This was conservation camp put on by the state of Tennessee. But let me also make another disclaimer. That wasn't my first snake bite experience. That wasn't the day I actually joined the snake bite club. Because you see, I was born a member of that club. The Bible tells lots of snake stories. Uh, lots of experiences that we find of serpents and language about the asps and the vipers. The earliest one is found in the earliest pages of scripture. It's the record of what happened in the garden. You remember that, don't you? 
how a serpent was involved, slithering into the garden and tempting the woman and the man, and how they fell prey to his temptation, how they willingly did what God had asked them not to do. We call that sin. And they were bitten. God spoke a word of judgment after what we call the fall, when sin entered the world. It was a word of judgment directed towards the woman and the man and the serpent. We find that recorded in Genesis 3, beginning in verse 13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, listen to this, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. A record of when sin entered the world the roll of a serpent, the sting of his bite. But note, the judgment was not simply extended to the man and the woman, but to their offspring. And we find clear evidence of that as we continue reading, not much further in the Bible, about Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. Born children of the fall, bitten, the Bible says, born dead in trespasses and sins. It's a state of human beings. But Abel also willingly sinning against God as out of jealousy he kills his own brother. Spiritual lostness, the result of sin, was a problem that entered the world first in the generation of Adam and Eve. And it became from that moment on their greatest problem. But it was also a problem of their children. And the world's greatest problem in the days of their children was Sin resulting in lostness. But it continued in every generation to follow. And so we see in the days of Noah how the people had rebelled against God to such a degree that God brought judgment through the flood. Lostness was the greatest problem of the world in Noah's day. It continues generation after generation. We get to uh, the prophets and we find that in the days of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, lostness is the world's greatest problem. That, that the Lord, as people continue to rebel and sin against him, speaks through the prophets a word of coming judgment because of their sin. But even then, the Lord begins to speak about a solution to this problem. About a Messiah who would come to give his life for the sins of the world. And yet the problem continued and continues in our day. In fact, lostness is a greater problem in the world today than it has ever been in human history. Why would I say it's a greater problem today? Well, you probably saw the headlines just a few weeks back. Our our world population crossed 8 billion. Man, that's a bunch of people. More lost people alive today than ever before in human history. More lost people will die today than ever before in human history. Each year, our research team at the International Mission Board provides me with an update to a very grim statistic. Uh, This statistic is based upon three sets of data. One is uh, global population. Uh, The second set of data that goes into calculating this statistic is the daily death rate reported country by country around the world. The third set of data is religious affiliation. What do people claim to believe? Who do they claim to follow? And based upon those three sets of data, the statistic that they provide me is an estimate of the number of people who die around the world every single day having given no indication that they have heard the gospel Or if they have heard it, that they have committed their lives to being followers of Jesus, been born again and been saved. That number is higher today than it's ever been in human history. Today, 157,690 people will die lost. And the same number tomorrow. 
and the day after that, and that there is no greater problem facing our world today. No problem that even begins to measure compared to that problem. If you were to ask me, why does Champion Force exist? Why are you here? Uh, why have you been here since 1970 and you're still here today? I would tell you this, simple terms. Champion Force is here today to address the world's greatest problem, lostness. Because you see, you know the solution. There are yet 3,000 people groups around the world that have no access to the gospel. We refer to those people groups as unreached and unengaged. They've not yet been reached with the gospel. In fact, they've not yet even been engaged. What, what does it mean to be unengaged with the gospel? Well, in the simplest of terms, if you uh, were a, a, a member of that people group, if you were among those people, you could not go to church today to hear the gospel preached because there's no church yet among your people. You could not walk through your town or village or city or community today and, and, and meet a missionary who's there to share the gospel with you because the missionaries haven't made it to those people yet. That's why the IMB exists, to get a missionary presence among the lost peoples of the world. The reason what we do together is so important is because eternity is hanging in the balance. There's no greater problem. It's a universal problem. It's an eternal problem. We know the solution. What is that solution? What's well, interesting that Jesus, in trying to explain to a man by the name of Nicodemus, who he, Jesus, was and what he had come to do, how he was the solution, tells Nicodemus a snake story. He's actually referencing uh, uh, true events that happened, as is recorded in the Old Testament, among the children of Israel when they're along that journey from the land of Egypt where they were slaves to the promised land. And all the years that they spent wandering time and time again as they wandered through the wilderness, they were rebelling against God, not obeying Him, sinning, and, and God many times had to bring judgment and correction to them. And at one point, the judgment that God brought to the people of Israel was venomous snakes, vipers that were in the camps of the Israelites and were biting the people, and the people were dying coming to terms with their sin and God's judgment upon that sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is always death. The people began to cry out to God, to, to, to repent and to ask for his forgiveness. And Moses, their leader, cried out on their behalf. And God, who is gracious and merciful, provided a solution. Do you remember what that solution was? The Lord said to Moses, Moses, Fashion a, a serpent, a snake of bronze, and, and set it upon a pole. And anyone who is bitten among the Israelites as the vipers are in the camps, if they will look at that bronze serpent, simply looking at that bronze serpent will mean they will not die. They will survive the snake bite. Jesus referencing that story to Nicodemus, helping Nicodemus understand who he is and why he had come, said, well, we find it recorded in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And thus has God solved the problem of lostness. Jesus died upon the cross for your sin and the sin of the world. But the solution doesn't just end at the cross. No, the solution takes us to an empty tomb where three days later the one who died was raised, proving he is the solution. And any who would put their trust in him can have their greatest problem solved. Several years ago, there were a couple of men that a Baptist church that showed up in the church parking lot on a weekday evening. Showed up in the church parking lot on a weekday evening because it was church visitation night. Uh, it was a church a lot like this one in the sense that it was a Baptist church and had a parking lot. 
It was unlike this one in the sense that uh, that church building and the parking lot could have easily fit in this room. Just a small church in a little town over in the mountains. The men did what they'd come to do. Began to walk through the neighborhoods in a little town, knocking on doors. Anyone came to the door, got an invitation to church. At some point in the evening, they climbed a very steep hill in the little mountain town, made their way up to the next to last house on the road, a little rental house at 210 Province Street. Stepping up on the porch, they knocked on the door. A young man in his mid-twenties came to the door. I don't know if they knew about his circumstances. As I said, it was a small town. You know how small towns are. They may have known everything about his circumstances. Had they known about him, what they would have known is he was about two years past the divorce. And he was raising his three kids on his own. Those kids at the time, all boys, would have been ages three, four, and six. What they could not have possibly known, whether they know any of that or not, what they could not have possibly known is that the four-year-old somewhere in the house would someday be the president of the International Mission Board. But they knew enough. They knew enough to know people not in church need to be in church. They knew enough to know that broken families need the Lord. And the greatest need in any person's life is a relationship with Jesus Christ that solves their greatest problem. So when dad came to the door, they invited him to church. Thankfully, he accepted their invitation, managed to get three rowdy boys ready the next Sunday, and he took us to church. He did so the Sunday after that and the Sunday after that. You know what we found is that soon became the pattern of our family. We found the same thing there that I found when I arrived again at Champion Forest today. We found a church family that welcomed us in that loved us and shared the gospel with us. A few years later, there's another knock at our door, still living in that little rental house, and Dad opened the door. Our pastor was standing there. He was expected. Dad had invited him because my older brother had been asking questions about the gospel. So Dad told Brother Allen to come on in. Pastor Allen shared the gospel with my older brother, answered his questions. Says, my younger brother and I, we sat in the floor listening. And Pastor Allen got three for one that night as the three of us committed our lives to Christ. Baptized together just a few weeks later at the little First Baptist Church of Jellicoe, Tennessee. Oh, how thankful I am for a couple men in the church out knocking on doors who cared enough of their neighbors to tell them the solution to their greatest problem. How thankful I am for a pastor like Pastor Jared and the pastors here at your church whose greatest desire and passion is to see those who don't know the Lord come to know the Lord. How thankful I am for a little church that knew why it was there. And how grateful I am to be at a church just like that today. Wouldn't have to go far out of the parking lots of Champion Forest to find a broken family. Lost and hurting man, woman, boy, or girl. Go across this city and you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of them. That's why you're here. Get on a plane, as many of you have done, and go serve alongside of some of our missionaries overseas. We introduce you to billions of them. That's why you're here. See, the world's got a problem. You know the solution. Church, never forget why you're here. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforest.org slash connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus in person on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.